you all enjoyed lunch and um, God, it was badly needed. You know, it was, a, it was a long morning, but I hope you've really enjoyed the session so far. Um, and this afternoon is brilliant because we're opening it out to all of our ATU partners across um, and St. Angela's College as well, who will be coming into the fold very, very soon. Uh, so without further ado, what I'm going to do is invite the chair for the, um, for the first theme up, um, Shelley Brady, who's going to introduce the theme, and Shelley will also introduce the two um, speakers as well. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Shelley Brady and I'm here to introduce theme one, which is engagement, recruitment and keeping interest. So I'm delighted to welcome Trish O'Connell, uh, Dr. Trish O'Connell to talk. First of all, she's a lecturer in the School of Science and Computing in ATU Galway City and she's going to talk to us on statistical tools for manufacturing. Thanks Trish. Thank you Shelley. Okay, so good afternoon everyone and welcome to my presentation on using UDL to foster student engagement in a year four module. Let's see how this goes. In terms of time, or oh, 14 minutes, oh, I thought it was only eight. This is great. I can yabber on it at length. Okay, so as you can see my agenda is very short, but actually it's not. It's like most of what I do is a little bit of a plot twist, shall we say. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about my UDL journey. It's been a long one and I'm going to talk to you about engagement and my conclusion of what my students said, because I'm a great believer in getting the student voice. So my UDL journey. In 2011, I was working as adjunct faculty in NUI Galway and Regis University, which is in Denver in Colorado. And in 2012, I was tasked with a module redesign for the online masters in software engineering. I was an online facilitator, which is why I was adjunct faculty. And basically what I did was I was working on the software engineering module. So in 2013, I was fortunate and lucky enough to work with a fantastic instructional designer who taught me all about universal design for learning and she taught me how to incorporate it into my module that I was designing. So in 20, September of 2013, I rolled out this brand new facilitated and facilitated this brand new upgraded module. Up until this, what we'd been doing, it's gone to 6.58 now, up until this, <laughs> so I'm just keeping an eye on the clock, up until this, what had happened was it was very much just a slide deck that the students were, waded their way through. But I put in lots of stuff like multimedia, and I'm still doing a bit of that. And in December 2013, I joined what was GMIT and what is now ATU Galway City Campus. And I continued to use UDL. So you might say that when I was working with the instructional designer, I was reading the book. When I was using it in GMIT from 2013 until now, I've been wearing the t-shirt. And in 2021, I got the badge and today I got the cake, which was even better again. <laughs> So, engagement. It just makes sense to me that the material that we present to learners should be interesting and stimulate them to want to learn and make them want to actively engage. And I try my best to try and do this. And the reason I try and do it is because as far as I'm aware, learning is as much a cognitive, as much, it's as much an effective um, process as a cognitive process. It's not just about getting them to think about the module, but get them to feel that they want to engage with it. And that brings us to the point that students need to want to learn what we need, or what we should be wanting to teach. How I actually do this is I use this. Anybody from marketing here? No marketeers, okay. This is the hierarchy of effects module and it's called the AIDA model. And the idea with the AIDA model is you start by trying to grab people's attention. You want to secure their attention. Then you want to evoke their interest in what you're teaching. Then you want to stimulate their desire to want to learn. And finally, you want to get them to initiate action. In other words, to learn, okay? So I've applied this model throughout all of my teaching career, which has been rather long, I'm afraid. Okay, so this is what my students said. First of all, I decided at the end of the module, and I'm gonna to talk to you about the module that I've been doing this with in a second. I asked them how they, what was their preferred way of studying the module, and as you can see there, there's about 48 in the class. So some of these modalities are represented twice as in students like PowerPoint slides, but they also liked this, that, and the other. So what I give them is a choice of PowerPoint slides, recorded lecture, multimedia presentations, and I'm a big believer. Now, unfortunately, I cannot do the graphic facilitation, but I'm going to sign up for Tamsin, put my name down, please. I use the OneNote class note because I believe if you can engage them as you're drawing, and I don't draw very well, but I teach statistics, so there's a lot of maths in it. And as such, I tend to need to, to write. And when we were online during the pandemic, I found OneNote to be absolutely brilliant as a whiteboard tool. 
So I decided to ask my students what they thought. And one said that the visuals for my module are good and how I write using the whiteboard as I go along is better than other modules that just have a ton of writing. And again, that plays into the fact that I'm doing it live. I record all my lectures, but I also give them live. So I'm doing it synchronously, but I record what I'm doing. So in other words, the students have the benefit then of being able to go back after I've finished. Oh my God, I've only got three minutes left. We better keep going. So another student said that they really liked the module and the way it was delivered. And this is my favorite one. Trish has got it bang on. <laughs> to my mind, that says it all. That's my students are happy campers, okay? So this is the rest of the plot. I'm going to talk to you about the module that I used it in and how I actually did it. And I'm going to try and do all of this in three minutes and 33 seconds. So the module, and if I could just have a little bit more time, it would have been a lot more sensible. But as it is, I feel like I'm speed reading. Um, so the module in question was Statistical Tools for Manufacturing. It's a fourth year module, which I teach in semester one. And so it's quite a large class, about 48, 50, 56 usually in it. Now, the fact that they're fourth years and the fact that they are going to be going out on placement in semester two, and once they finish their placement, they will ultimately be getting paid employment. I focus very much on the end game, and I talk to them a lot about the fact that they will be in paid employment very soon. Also, I am a great believer in authenticity. My background is an engineer. So I have been working as an engineer in process engineering. So I understand the tools that I'm using to teach them. I also understand what they need to be able to do. So it's very much a case of, I'm looking at my students and thinking, would I hire you? Hmm, you need a bit of polishing, you need a bit of work, you need to be able to do this. So I know in my head what I need them to be able to do. On that basis, I teach them real methods for real environments and real applications. So how I do this, before they ever see me, I mean, God help my students that do have to put up with me, but before they ever see me, we have Mood, which is our VLE. And what I do is I put up a welcome video. So in this welcome video, I start by talking to them about this is the module I'm going to be teaching you and I'm going to gear you to getting a job because ultimately, hopefully that's what you've come to college for is to get a qualification and to be able to work. So it's all about focusing on their ability to learn from me what they need for interviews and what they need to do to be able to hit the ground running when they get into employment. The next thing I talked about is, is the, the, the subject is statistical tools for manufacturing quality. So I talked to them about what kind of quality is required and why variation is inherent in a manufacturing environment and as such they absolutely need to be able to use these tools when they get into industry. So hopefully I'm stimulating their interest by saying, oh yeah, that sounds interesting. Um, this is my favourite slide actually because I think there was a slide in World War II where I think it was like, the country needs you. And that finger, if you're watching a video and that finger comes at you in the video, I think that's pretty powerful. So I'm telling them then on completion of the module what I expect that they'll be able to do. So they'll be able to implement process monitoring, they'll be able to evaluate the stability of a manufacturing process. They won't be able to lead a Six Sigma project, but they can certainly participate in one and they'll know what they're doing. They will be able to perform failure mode and effect analysis. They will know about cause and effect and they'll know about experimental design and ANOVA. So in other words, I'm going to give them a tool set to go into work with. <laughs> It's not my best angle, honestly. Um, you can see now what my students think of me. I'm a bit nutty. Okay, I'm going to tell them how we're going to achieve it. Okay. <laughs> can I go down here? I'm going to tell them how I can achieve it. I tell them that we're going to do all of these things week on week, and it's going to build to the point where when they get out, they will be fully equipped to be contributors to a manufacturing company. I also believe in having a contract with my students. Now, when I worked for... M or NUIG, oh, that's very, very off-putting. When I worked for NUIG in Regis, we used to have a written contract of engagement with students. And that's not a bad idea. But what I do with my students is I tell them what I'm going to do for them, and then I tell them what I expect from them. So basically, I tell them that I'm going to create, curate, and deliver weekly content that will be exciting and interesting, I hope, and that I'm going to share my experience. Now, I do have a lot of experience, so from that point of view, I never shut up. Um, I'll talk about topics of interest that come up as, we, as they do in manufacturing. And the next bit is organising a biopharma showcase. And I'm not sure if I don't think those slides are terribly clear, so apologies for that. Um, so more about the biopharma showcase in one second, okay? And I'll give them feedback. I work on formative feedback and summative feedback. And then I tell them what I expect from them. I expect them to turn up, be ready to learn, ready to listen. And if they don't know, to ask me, because I am quite approachable. I expect them to act with integrity, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to keep going from that. Oh God, it's in the red. Um, any of you who've got kids, you'll understand the phrase spilling the tea. To my mind, it's all about giving them a little bit of an insight into you as a person. So it's not that I use my classes as group therapy. I don't. 
but I do intersperse bits into my class. Like, for example, if my son or my daughter didn't do particularly well in an exam, I'm quite happy to share that and explain why. And they usually enjoy hearing these little snippets out of your life. Like, you know, um, also I tell them that I'm not afraid of them because I've caged eye with white sharks and as such, they're not going to scare me. And also an animal lover, so from that point of view, I foster cats and I've got a dog. I talk about music. I just basically... I think I'm a bit of an entertainer, really, at heart. Uh, so all of those things on the left, I spill the tea. But again, only in small bits. My main focus is on getting the content covered. The Biopharma Showcase is something that since I joined GMIT in 2013, I've been doing every two years. And that's the post from 2018. It's supposed to have happened in 2020, but unfortunately, due to COVID, that didn't happen. What it is, is where I get speakers to come back from industry who have worked, as they've been graduates of mine in GMIT, I'm following them on LinkedIn, they're following me on LinkedIn, so we have a relationship and if I see something interesting, I'll reach out and I'll say, would you like to come and present at the Biofarm Conference? And they say, love to, because they love to come back and share. So that was the, so in 2021, I decided to run it online. Now that was scary because I wasn't sure would my presenters send me in the files on time. You guys know all about the joys of this, um, but they did and as such we had Henrique, who graduated in 2019, I think it was, and he's now working as a manufacturing technician in Kragana, and he basically shared his wisdom of what he's found in, in a working life, what's important, what you need to be picking up on in college that will be useful to you in work. And usually it's my module, of course. Um, she said very unashamedly. Um, so then we had him. We had Mary T, who graduated in 2013. She is now a quality manager in Sydney, in Australia, in a company called Sabre Medical, and she had so much to say. They're, these people are terrific for sharing. And then Rory came from Toronto, or you, you put in his presentation from Toronto, and again, these people, I owe them so much because they share everything of their experience and their journey, and that's so important to the undergraduates of today. Um, then I try and keep it going. How I do that, to keep them entertained, keep them engaged, is I have what I call like the water cooler moment, like you'd have it in industry. I call it coffee chat. So basically it's a place for them to hang out. Now they don't actually use this as much as I'd like. And I'm really sorry about the time, I'm gonna keep going. Um, but I also use a lot of humor in my presentation. So I, I love the top one. Anyone who's watched Game of Thrones, you'd have to love your man there. Um, okay, so I keep them going with humor. And a lot of what I do as well, and I'm having to rush now, and I don't like rushing, is I use a lot of lesson planning. So I tell them in the lecture where they've been last week, where we're gonna do this week, keeping them focused on the topics at all times. Um, at the beginning of my Moodle page as well, they will see this, which is basically a week-to-week, -week, uh, what do you call it, lesson plan of where we're going to be, what we're going to cover, what labs we're going to do. And I think this also tends to make them engaged because maybe they'll see something and go, oh, that could be interesting. And again, I tell them during the class, during the weeks that I have them, that I'm going to be able to teach them the buzzwords that they need for when they go into industry. If they can say, and I've done some lean manufacturing, the employee's going to go... I want that person because those are the kind of things the employers are looking for. And then also, finally, you're probably all familiar with the VARC model, the visual, auditory, kinesthetic, uh, read, write modalities of learning. I try and facilitate all of my students by doing something like that. So this is an example of my week seven module, um, my week seven, one of my week seven modules from the class, where basically I do a PowerPoint slide. I also have given up the recording of that, of that lecture. They have a multimedia component that they can flick back and forward with. I do a, if I can find a good paper that linked to the read-write um, people, they get that. And I also have a lab, which is going to be very hands-on because we use statistical software like Minitab or something like that to try and get them to actually do the things themselves, okay? And I think, four minutes, I'm really sorry. Uh, thank you very much. That's it. Now, where do you want to sit? Does anybody have any quick questions for Trish? No? I have a quick one. Well, go on. I think I know the answer, but do you find it onerous embedding UDL into your programmes? Not in the slightest. No. Um, it's, it's something that comes naturally, I think. Okay, can I get off the stage now? Get off the stage. Thank you. <laughs> I'll take the clicker if that's okay, Trish. Oh, yeah. So I have to make it walking away with these. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so thank you so much, Trish. That was a brilliant presentation, so practical. I'd like to welcome Geraldine Dignan now to the stage. Um, Geraldine is a lecturer here in ATU Sligo uh, in the Faculty of Science, and she's going to talk to you about role models, roadmaps, and real recreation, so multiple means of engaging students in workplace competencies. Hi, everybody. 
Um, so this presentation is about um, my attempts, I suppose, to engage students in uh, developing workplace competencies. And the title, I suppose, um, reflects that. So the strategies I used were to provide roadmaps, to introduce more role models, and this idea of real recreation. And this speaks to my interest in authentic learning as well. Um, the module itself is called Pharmaceutical Work Practice. It's a 10 credit module in the fourth year of the pharmaceutical program. Uh, students um, have to, at the end of it, demonstrate that they have pharma industry competency. So it's a very regulated industry. Uh, they have to be able to discuss the operations relevant to that industry, solve problems in that regulatory context, critically reflect on their own competencies within that, and distinguish their own role within team-based problem solving. So they're the things that I want to um, achieve from the module. And it's structured basically with a series of um, learning activities, so lectures, the support of lectures. There's, um, we've had a couple of industry visits. Now they are, they have been affected by COVID, but we'll reintroduce. And then um, a number of problem solving, so team-based, sorry, team-based problem solving workshops. Um, these are authentic, uh, so based on, they're designed based on Harrington's principles, where we have a, an authentic task generated by industry, a real case study. We uh, um, have tried to provide an authentic context. We involve industry in feeding back, so we have access, access to expertise. And then students do some reflection on their uh, involvement, um, on their own work, and there's some peer and self-assessment uh, along the way. So when I started on looking at this from a UDL perspective, this is my scribble. I don't know if you can read it very well, but this has been on my notice board, I suppose, for all year. And I'm always interested in why. Why do students want to do this? Why should they want to engage in the module? Um, and so from UDL, um, to engage students, um, it recommends that you provide options for, number one, recruiting their interest in the first place. Number two, sustaining that effort and keeping them persisting in that. And number three, self-regulation, which is really their internal kind of regulation and emotional um, involvement in it as well. Um, so this was my focus. I tried to keep that really simple. Um, and I'm going to uh, look at each one of those. So strategy number one was to improve, I suppose, my roadmaps that I was, that in terms of how the module was delivered. So setting the direction in the first place and sustaining their effort. So I thought this was something I could work on. Um, and the first thing I did with this is I looked at how I was assessing them. So I, I tracked, I usually list the assessments and provide all the links in one tab in Moodle. And I reordered this to make it more logical. So it ends with the final assessment is essentially like an interview presentation where they're, where they're interviewing for a particular job. So the first few weeks, um, they assess and explore their own career goals, maybe choose a job target, and they try to establish a personal brand. And the first assignment is that they have a targeted LinkedIn profile and a CV. Um, then, once they have that target identified, they spend the next few weeks really researching that in more detail, building their knowledge on their area of interest, and they're writing a report about that. Um, and that's the next assignment. Then, after that, they've built some knowledge themselves, and they're ready to engage then in the team-based problem-solving workshops. We run those over about five or six weeks, and three, the last three are assessed. Um, so they get to engage there and experience uh, uh, team-based problem solving. They get to demonstrate some competence, competencies themselves and reflect on their own competencies. And then they're kind of prepared, I suppose, on reflection to arrive at an interview for a target job opportunity. And it's the one they've chosen themselves. Um, and they can also choose if they like, um, you know, a research or postgraduate programme of interest either. Um, so I also, in terms of roadmaps, looked at simplifying my Moodle page. I actually took away all the graphics to start with, and maybe I'll change that as it goes on. But um, I provide, uh, just provided all the assessment briefs with the grading matrices at the outset, so they have to self-manage the, the process. Uh, provided the learning supports and tools in, in one tab. And then I built in three individual feedback sessions. So there's uh, two in the middle and one at the very end. So where they get one-on-one -on -one consultations, basically. So there's weeks blanked out for just one-on-one -on -one consultation. And then I 
put the schedule up as well so they can see clearly what week to week was going, where were the feedback sessions and where were the assessment times. So they have to plan and manage their engagement then in that. So that was my roadmaps. Strategy two was to, to kind of at the very beginning to, to recruit interest and to keep that was to provide better role models to help them visualise um, and maybe inspire um, uh, possibility for themselves. Um, and for this, I connected with um, past graduates on LinkedIn. I've been building this uh, a network for a few years. Um, and uh, I tried to find a diverse range of graduates uh, with, that represented very different career pathways from there. But these were people who sat in the same seats, essentially, um, either a year or up to five years before. So I've gone, I had a diverse range of, uh, of levels. Um, what I did, we had a semi or a symposium with semi-structured interviews followed by Q&A. Students were able to ask questions um, and uh, they found this, this really, really, really uh, useful. They also helped them to build their, um, start building their own professional networks in LinkedIn. Um, and then the last strategy I used was around what I considered real recreation. So real in terms of the authentic learning. So I had uh, previously developed some workshops around Harrington's authentic learning principles, but I wanted to introduce a little bit more play into this. So the three workshops that were assessed um, were um, the industry linked the last two, one with Abbott, one with AbV, and they get progressively, so I, I reordered them so that they got progressively more difficult and that the, uh, the more playful one at the very beginning is a kind of a hands-on manufacturing uh, lean Six Sigma where they improve a process. Um, this is more playful at the beginning, but I decided to go further back than that because I found that students, uh, certain students, to involve them, they needed a little bit more time to play around before the stakes got higher and they were in front of industry. Um, so I introduced um, an extra workshop at the beginning, kind of a practice one, and I really spent a lot of time, um, I introduced this board game called Play for GMP, and it really, I don't know if you know about the regulated industry, but it basically uh, represents quality systems, and it's like a monopoly board, um, and I actually assumed that everybody knew what Monopoly was, but believe it or not, I had such diversity in my class that I had a number of students who had never played Monopoly and didn't know anything about it. So, but it was great because what it did was um, promoted the industry language, provided um, multiple means of action and expression. They were, they were kind of my aims at the beginning, but actually it was much uh, broader than that, I found. It was a lot of laughter, real engagement, a really good icebreaker. And it also threw up loads of interesting discussion points. So they start to kind of argue over an answer or something. Oh, I didn't know that. And then you'd get this kind of dialogue going. Um, it also gave them confidence on prior knowledge. So they actually knew more than they might have thought before they went into the other workshops. It introduced key terminology because there's a lot of terminology in this industry. Um, and for me, the most important thing was that it allowed everyone to participate. So um, I think... Uh, we have a lot of shyer students, students from ethnic minorities, students whose uh, native tongue isn't English, and they come in and definitely there are barriers there to involving themselves. And this was great. It was a really good icebreaker. Um, this is maybe overkill, but I, for the last workshop, uh, the most complicated one, I also kind of tidied that up and provided a kind of a one-stop shop web page for that, so that when they went into it, the, the scaffolding was a little bit better. So overall, um, the impact, and this impact, I, 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 it's important to say this isn't you know, rigorous research. This is me looking at students' uh, reflections and uh, some of the uh, just general survey information at the end and my own observations. Uh, student reflect, they do a lot of reflective writing, so they all really valued the, the graduates, the past graduates on LinkedIn. They all really valued that opportunity for one-on-one -on -one consultation. Um, the board game was mentioned as a great icebreaker. They enjoy the workplace, the active, authentic workshops, and I was delighted because some of them specifically mentioned the resources uh, being on one page for the workshop being really helpful. So for me, that was a bit of a win. My observations also with the roadmaps, um, 
had a really high on-time submission rate this year, so it, that definitely had an impact, I think. Um, I would say, for me, what I'm interested in now is the kind of goal setting aspect of it. Goal setting can seem really hard for students, so that very, the first few weeks. Um, and, you know, I usually start by asking them, why are you here? You know, and you need to reflect on, we get, take time to reflect on that. So why am I here? And for a lot of them, they've ne they haven't actually thought about that. And some of them find that hard to answer. Um, so it's really important to ask that at the beginning and hold them accountable because when they goal set, the next steps for students can vary widely. So some people, their goal is to turn up every week and for other people, it's like I'm an aspiring leader. You know, I want to be this. Um, low stakes play, oh my God, I'm going way over time, is very valuable. Um, I think particularly for participation and I would say individual consults are essential because uh, what I found is students ignore the brief all the time, all the time, um, and they need to be kind of touched back in with it. Um, I won't continue because I've gone over time, but my, I'm interested, I suppose, in maximising the potential of LinkedIn as a, as a tool. And I know there's a mycareerpath.ie, there's a new uh, thing being introduced, and I'd like to use that maybe to look at, link it to real graduate opportunities and really get them kind of moving to that. Um, promoting goal setting at the beginning um, and then doing less, playing more and going a bit deeper. I think that's what I probably would leave people with. Thank you. Thanks, Geraldine. That was brilliant. Has anybody any questions for Geraldine? Great. Serious enough for them, or no, okay. no, not not with a board game. You know, they actually the board game is easier. You know, I think I've tr I've tried other things. You know, in the past with, that yeah. are you know where you're getting up and moving around, and people tend to be a little bit more exposed. But you're not exposed in a board game at all. It's actually a really safe place to be. So that, that, that board game yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. The answer is no. I mean, I. Um, so the board game was very much uh, an on-campus thing. Yeah. They're, they're they're very well maybe. So that's something I haven't explored at all. But uh, I'm sure that there probably is. This came from Lean Games, I think. Or um, so, yeah. Okay, brilliant. Thanks so much, Trish and Geraldine. That was really enjoyable. Um, I'm delighted now to welcome Colin Tierney to the stage. He is the chair for Theme 2. And Colin is the developmental, development coordinator for UDL in uh, Galway, at ATU Galway. So thank you very much. Hello everyone. Um, like I said, I'm Colin Tierney. Uh, very lovely to be here. Um, I am chairing theme two, um, which is delivery, showcasing UDL teaching approaches, so on face-to-face -face and online. So I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker, uh, Ellen, Dr. Ellen McCabe, instructional designer here at I, oh, I almost said IT Sligo, sorry, ATU Sligo um, in Kelt. So Ellen has worked in educational research for 12 years, um, and she's interested in uh, student supports and disseminating inclusive pedagogy. So she's going to be talking about the, uh, her work with the iNote project, um, the student journey. So welcome. All right. So hello, hello everyone. Um, I'm an instructional designer and I'm a member of the iNode team at ATU Sligo here, and iNode's been mentioned a couple of times already today. And it's basically, um, the title of the project is Innovative Opportunities Transforming Education. It's essentially looking at uh, innovations in online learning. And the aspect of uh, iNote <coughs> that we were concerned with here 
um, was the development of an online learning student support services model. And the, in, the initial challenge for this strand of iNote was creating a primary framework that would kind of guide the project. Um, so a definitive um, structure um, was necessary to provide just, to provide just very clear visibility um, of what was already available um, to students and highlight any significant gaps or overlaps um, and kind of potential areas for collaboration. And um, I think this approach was particularly vital for a multi-campus project um, such as this. Um, so while the ATU does um, provide a range of supports for students um, already prior to the project, um, as often kind of happens in um, large organisations, some supports can be quite siloed and conveying the right information at the right time can be challenging. So um, when we can take kind of into consideration as well the demographic of an online learner who sort of typically be uh, mature or it could be juggling work um, and family commitments, clarity is really key. So um, it was vital that supports be designed and introduced in a really strategic manner um, <clears throat> and in a holistic way. So kind of ensuring that um, accessibility and coherence. Um, and in this way, facilitating an infrastructure where students could kind of intuitively comprehend um, what supports might be used together, might be used at a similar stage, and how they kind of relate to one another. Um, so if, when we were trying to kind of enhance the visibility and legibility of student supports, we really needed to get a sense um, of what was there already, the existing support offering, and the experience of um, the students and uh, different stakeholders that were engaging with them on an everyday basis. Um, and this could only really be accomplished by, um, by talking to them. Um, so to achieve this, uh, the project team collaborated with our colleagues in Letterkenny and Galway Mayo, and we conducted um, three focus groups. Um, the first of these was held at former IT Sligo in um, March 2020, and then following the move online, um, LYIT and GMIT sessions were held um, digitally. And there were 24 participants in all, including past and current students, um, employers, lecturers, regional stakeholders, and technical and support staff. So um, issues kind of providing support, um, a support community for online learners were really born out during, during these sessions. And as one student kind of described it, when you're online, that's missing. So you have to just log in, you get this much time, you've got your piece and then you're left until the next week and that's the disconnect. Um, and a lecturer kind of alluded to the limita limitations of a sort of accommodations based model um, and adequately supporting students needs when they said um, that students need to make sure you let us know. Um, we can't do anything until we know that there's a challenge there. I think that kind of came up in the questions earlier um, that uh, it's kind of that's problematic in that a lot of students don't want to disclose that they have a disability um, or a learning issue um, and they might be unaware of what's available to them um, and as well if they are a mature learner it's possible they have uh, they could have been out of education for a long period of time and they might have an issue that's never been assessed and um, so <clears throat> while kind of casual interactions can and they should be facilitated online chance recommend recommendations from peers, for example, um, or like say the opportunity to just walk past the um, academic writing centre and know it's there by seeing it are um, <clears throat> less likely online. Um, so as a result, students really need to be significantly motivated or what might be a better word is empowered to seek out services that are relevant to them. So curating our message in relation to supports so that it puts them in the context of the student's learning journey was really essential. So through the focus group, three kind of elemental stages of the student experience were identified. Um, and these were before they arrive, while you learn and when you move on. So kind of taking into consideration the different stages of the student experience and the specific support the students need at that time. So this interactive graphic was developed to give structure to the iNote work package and any supports we developed along the way, but it's also a practical support for students that they can use, like a practical tool. And it offers a kind of a broad overview of the support community, how services relate to one, one another and when they could be most relevant. And so that students can kind of see at a glance what's there 
um, and uh, <clears throat> what, what could be more, most relevant to them. Um, and these are all hyperlinked to the relevant resources. So while we're kind of striving to map all stages of their time as a student and provide that clarity, um, the necessity for kind of human contact and guidance and reassurance can't ever really be replicated. Um, so crucially, the um, student advisor is available throughout their journey um, as a student at ATU um, to, to provide that support and reassurance. Um, so from this kind of broad basis, students can kind of dig down a bit more into more detailed information on individual supports. Um, and guidance in each section is arranged around kind of key questions that the student would be facing at those particular stages. Um, so, you know, how do I choose a course and how, how do I apply? How do I apply? Um, and so kind of directing students to relevant supports um, in relation to these queries and guidance on how they might be utilised. Um, so similarly, like uh, while you study, we kind of have information around the support community and how students could participate in that. Um, and um, this uh, framework is in use by the online student advisors as a kind of a central resource um, for supports throughout the university. Um, as well as this, it's also available on the ATU website and it's kind of sitting on a web page that's designed around this um, basic framework as well. Um, so the established uh, framework structure, um, it kind of allowed us to um, have this systematic approach to the design and introduction of supports throughout the iNote project. Um, and uh, allowed by maintaining that kind of comprehensive visibility, we were allowed to, able to sort of take that a little bit further um, and consider new approaches to the integration of supports into curricula and kind of to mitigate the need for students to seek out supports. Um, so one simple way we kind of achieved that was by placing um, supports directly on Moodle pages through a university-wide template and kind of putting them in the context of the curriculum um, along with things like, you know, assessment and learning outcomes. So it was kind of a little bit more meaningful to them and just more accessible as well. Um, as well as that, we developed a academic writing badge which has kind of formed the template for the design of flexible and intuitive resources and um, it's been um, <clears throat> a great way for lecturers to embed supports directly into their curricula and in a way that suits their particular, um, their particular subject area. And it's kind of forming the basis now and provided a um, design framework for um, a ATU kind of foundation course, which we're in the middle of developing now. Um, so, um, Yeah, so uh, I'm, just, I'm going to come to an end now, but um, just to say that while the uh, initial framework kind of focused on the supports available at ATU Sligo, um, we are currently in, uh, collaborating with colleagues in Letterkenny and Galway and Mayo to uh, adapt it to their purposes. Um, and that it's uh, been a great way to kind of give a sense of clarity and connection and give coherence and legibility to supports developed through iNote. Um, I just wanted to finish off on this quote um, because I just think it's a nice way to kind of, a simple way of sum, summing up education in the kind of, uh, especially in the digital era, era and the contemporary era. Um, but I, and I also kind of like the fact that I recently found out that this is misattributed to Yeats. It's not actually a Yeats quote, which I think makes it even more appropriate that um, we're kind of, uh, through UDL, we're trying to sort of empower our students to um, be like active participants in their education and to interrogate their learning. And um, that can only happen if the, all students are properly supported um, and um, the right conditions are there. So like lighting a fire needs the right conditions. We need to support our students to have the right conditions to actively participate and become kind of active members in the uh, learning community. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Ellen. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, did anyone have any questions? We got one right away, right up front. Thanks so much. Do, do, do you want to step up here? Yeah. Accessible technology. Thanks very much for the assistance and turning the microphone on in the first instance. Um, that was great. I really love that concept of uh, mapping out 
the learner experience. Um, but it, and it did kind of bring me back to a point that it, I was reflecting on earlier on about the necessity, I suppose, to bring all attributes of the university experience together sometimes mm -hmm. when we're developing those m maps. And just as somebody who's worked very, very closely with librarians and information technologists, I did see the, the uh, focus on information technology here. But to what extent are librarians involved in this as well? How are they incorporated in, I suppose, enabling learners to make the very best of the resources that, the, that, are, that are available. So that, it's a two-part question. That's the major part, I suppose. Yeah. And the second one is to do with the, um, the, I suppose, the disparate nature of ATU as it is at the moment, and thinking about, and I think maybe you were alluding to this at the end, as to how that roadmap then becomes the universal roadmap mm. for all learners in ATU. Yeah, I think that that's obviously the the end goal. That um, while we're kind of using this in a, uh, to adapt it to the what's um, more relevant to those particular colleges, because um, that eventually they will all combine and we'll have one framework. Um, obviously, at the moment we're still kind of separate, really, in terms of systems, and that's probably quite a long. Well, no, hopefully not a long, but it's quite a complicated process to um, to bring them all together and integrate them fully. Um, uh, but that's obviously what we're working towards and something that the framework will um, eventually mirror. Um, with your, the first part of your question, um, absolutely the, um, the services of the, that are in place from the library, we've tried to map them very clearly as they are now, but as part of the, um, the, the work of iNote, and I just showed a quick slide of it there, um, the, the badges have worked really well in terms of kind of providing those kind of flexible scaffolds for, um, for student, um, I suppose what would be kind of termed soft skills, um, and, but uh, making them a little bit more structured um, and allowing students to adapt them to their own specific need. And we've worked with the library on uh, developing um, some badges around that. Um, uh, with their own content, so we we're, we're prob we'll probably look at doing a kind of a launch of that now in the next couple of weeks um, around things like information literacy, um, evaluating information and navigating system, systems like the library databases. Um, so they, they're kind of being expanded um, for online students through the project and that will obviously be fed back into the framework. Like um, the plan is that as supports are, um, added that they will be um, you know, included into the framework, but trying to keep them as clear and kind of to, um, um, what's the word, kind of um, curate them in a really well, because I think that's a huge issue. Like obviously we want students to have access to everything that's available to them, but it can be overwhelming and uh, can lose um, clarity. And um, so trying to yeah, present that information really thoroughly, but really clearly. Um, yeah, this kind of, okay. Is there anyone else? No. no? Thank you so much. Anna. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, fantastic. Um, our next presenter is, is Dr. Dimpna Walsh Gallagher. Um, a lecture in undergraduate and graduate, or sorry, postgraduate programs in nursing arts and disability studies at St. Angeles College. Also a disability liaison and a researcher. Um, you're going to be presenting on the impact of the implementation of UDL principles on the nursing practice skills. Of course, right? Yeah? Perfect. Great. Thank you, Colin, for that introduction. Now, so I'm going to talk to you today about the impact of the implementation of UDL principles on a nursing practice um, skills module. Um, so just to put it into context and to give you some background. Um, so modern day Irish society, as we all know, is becoming more culturally and ethnically, ethnically di diverse and thus leading to a more diverse community within the third level education.
Therefore, it is very important that the higher education institutions in Ireland will implement diversity and inclusion strategies that will positively impact staff and students alike. Over the last century, nursing qualifications and standards have risen, and with these changes, the education of nurses have moved from hospitals to schools of nursing and now to universities, where nurses can be awarded degrees, masters, PhDs, doctorates, to name but a few. I have been a lecturer now for over 20 years, and I have witnessed that the learning abilities of students within the same class or cohort can be very diverse. However, in order to meet their learning needs and ensuring that the learning outcomes of the programme are being met, many and varied teaching styles are required within the classroom settings and within the clinical uh, practice settings. Inclusion reflects a philosophy in which all students are educated within the same environment, an environment where each one of their individual needs are met, and creating an environment where everyone has an equal opportunity to succeed is not only fair, but evidence would suggest that it shows that a diversity leads to better and more impactfully scientific research. I applied the UDL principles to my teaching because it aims to improve the educational experiences of all students and it helps with the provision to cater for the diversity of learnings in our classrooms. The concept of the UDL in education considers the three distinct elements, multiple means of representation, action and expression and engagement. This encourages us then as educators to move away from our traditional style of teaching to a more flexible style of teaching where we can include podcasts, video material, YouTube clips, simulated environments, etc., which will then in turn enable our students to access information um, through multiple means. Now, the module that I chose to use for the purpose of the UDL implementation was the Nursing Practice Skills 4 module, Intellectual Disability. During this module, students will have the opportunity to, have, to further develop their knowledge and their competence in relation to advanced nursing skills of health, communication and advocacy. In addition, the student will be able to develop skills specific to delivering safe, evidence-based care, and they will be supported in their developing their critical thinking in relation to assessment, goal planning, implementation and evaluation of the nursing interventions when they're supporting a person with an intellectual disability to recovery or perhaps end-of-life care. The reason that I chose this particular module was that this was the first year that this module was running and both the students and I were quite apprehensive about certain aspects of it, in particular the death and dying aspects. Students were engaged in the classroom and theoretical element of death and dying. However, when they were preparing for the laboratory session the following week, they were then going to be reflecting on practice and indeed personal life experiences of perhaps caring for someone during the last 24 hours of life and immediately post-death. So some students alluded to the fact that they were wanting to do it, but afraid, they were afraid of breaking down, afraid of being upset, um, and other students didn't pass comment. So having applied the UDL principles to the engagement and the delivery of the theoretical components of the death and dying, I wanted and I needed to continue using this multiple means of engagement and the practical element of the skill because of its importance in the role of a nurse and indeed in every walk of life. This is an essential skill and therefore I knew that interest was there. It was ensuring that I could sustain it and at the same time giving every student the opportunity to reflect and also to self-reflect without causing upset and indeed share their opinions and their views, as well as learning from me and me learning from them. I wanted them to learn from each other as well. Um, this slide here now, if some maybe people in the audience were recently um, bereaved, I am going to play. It's only a minute of a clip, but it may bring people back into that environment. So I'm just preempting that it could hit a nerve. <clears throat> So I approached the clinical skills manager, Sharon, and I asked her if the laboratory could lend itself to a few small group teaching sessions. I discussed the skills that were involved, and after a lengthy discussion, we set up a therapy room, like a room at home, where we dimmed the lights. 
Um, we had a bedside locker, we had the lamp, we had a mannequin, we had a clock that we would turn off, and we had various religious um, customs around the, the setting. And we had a PowerPoint presentation, we had additional notes on the wall, and I made available all the handouts for the students as well. Now, just before each of these practical sessions, I introduced the students to the setup or the scene while playing the beautiful soft music. You can just hear it in the background. I went over the learning outcomes of the session and I explained that the environment was safe and that it was okay to get upset, share feelings, leave at any time, ask me questions if they needed a break. That was all okay. We could work together as a team. And um, I also advised you know, to question me at any time during the session if, if they wanted clarity or anything like that. Now, I firmly believe that providing these various and multiple modes of communication resulted in the students expressing themselves, sharing experiences, interacting with one another, and actually seeing that everyone deals with grief differently, but that it affects us all, and how important it is to allow families to grieve and also to be there for one another on this tough journey. It doesn't matter who we are or what we have, but we all do need a little bit of support. We're all made up of the same material and that we can be different but feel the same. We are diverse, but we are equal. So <clears throat> the following um, quotes really speak for themselves. And after the, the um, practical session, I asked the students to evaluate the skill aspect of the module only because each module is evaluated. Um, now, the students did um, comment afterwards as well, verbally to me, and um, that they, they did say that while it was a very emotional subject and they were wondering how was it going to be taught in a practical sense, um, th that after it, they felt at ease, they felt relaxed, they liked the music, they liked the small group, it gave them freedom to express themselves without you know, feeling different or feeling alone. Um, two students actually commented that, um, because in every cohort and in every walk of life, you're going to have differences in personalities, but they did comment that um, they were so together and personality differences couldn't be seen and that everybody was the same. Um, many students had asked, you know, that this would be a nice way to have many other skills um, being taught. Um, the students did report that they felt equal within the class and that there wasn't a right or wrong answer. They felt at ease. They felt able to reflect on their personal and their professional um, experiences of death and dying. And, um, I won't read them out, but the words there from the students, they speak from themselves. Paula reflected as well, um, and she reflected on her personal life experiences of the loss of her father. And, you know, just feeling at ease some years later that actually what she did and what her family did for her father was actually right. Um, so, uh, Cloda actually emailed me and, um, you know, put in, you know, just uh, how ease she felt and how important it was as a skill and that they liked the way, the, the, they liked the way I taught. <clears throat> In addition, another student who I heard back actually was requesting um, that skill to be taught um, commented as well, another a fourth year. So students were talking amongst themselves as well about the way things were done in the lab, just a bit differently. Um, so to conclude, this inclusion philosophy, therefore, would suggest that only through the merger of our resources, our talents and our knowledge can our students receive a comprehensive and appropriate education. And I believe that by applying the UDL principles in our teaching or within our modules will result in us fostering an all-inclusive student-centred curricula. So I, I recommend and I recommend for myself as well to continue um, implementing the UDL principles in practical and theoretical um, modules. That was my resources and I just wanted to thank you all for listening. Um, the DPA team and, and uh, Sharon and my colleagues in, in St Angela's. To the UDL team, Neve and Maureen of course was my facilitator and uh, to all of you for listening and most importantly to the students who actually evaluated and sat in on the class. Okay, so thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you.
Excellent, Dimjana. Thank you so much. Uh, would anyone like to ask any questions? We have one uh, off to the side there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, fantastic presentation. Um, I just, you. I, I'll be involved in teaching a clinical course, and you said you chose this module to really utilize UDL. Are, are there modules that you teach that where UDL is less of an emphasis, or, or is it just embedded in a different way? It's probably embedded in a different way. I mean, I would have thought before I did the UDL course that I would have implemented quite, a, <laughs> quite an amount of um, student friendliness, student centeredness, and, but it's when you self-reflect on what you're doing and really um, pay attention to detail. And we had Maureen as our facilitator who told us, you know, and advised us to do something new and different, and that's exactly what I did. But this module was new as well, even though it was in the fourth year of the curriculum, um, it was the first year of the rollout of that curriculum. So it was all um, very, very new. And thank you very much. Oh my God, you've no idea. I actually broke down in the lab. That's why I had to kind of preempt that. When I went into the lab after arranging the setup, doing the setup, I actually broke down myself. <laughs> so it definitely. <laughs> definitely. When I read the students' comments, of course, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much. Okay, um, now we're moving on to, th to theme three, which is materials. Um, and we'll have Laura Hegarty uh, from ATU Galway and Mayo uh, coming up to chair. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, so my name is Laura Hegarty, and I'm a lecturer in ATU Mayo Galway. Um, so I'm introducing theme three, um, materials adopt in a UDL classroom with accessible materials for all learning types. So we have two um, speakers here. The first one is um, Ulrich Huscher, uh, my colleague, and I did ask him how to pronounce it. So um, hopefully I, I did you justice. Um, so he's a lecturer in the Department of Culinary Arts um, at ATU Galway, and his top topic is transforming the virtual learning environment in the context of UDL. Now, um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much, Laura, for the introduction. Um, as I said, um, I'm a lecturer in culinary arts in Galway, and I want to talk to you about my transformation of the virtual learning environment in the context of UDL. One thing that became quite apparent to me at the start, as I set out on my journey in UDL, which only started in 2020, autumn semester, um, that I had heard about UDL, but I knew very little about it. And at the same time, as I progressed with my journey, I also learned that I had, unknowns to myself, implemented some elements of UDL in my teaching. But as I learned more and more about UDL, I really became aware that UDL provides a great a foundation and strategies to better engage uh, students with different needs in the context of teaching and learning. Um, my main focus was on the student experience of the virtual learning environment. And um, here I really concentrated on how the students experience this environment, specifically when students come to us in the first year of their studies. It can be quite daunting when they engage in this virtual learning environment. And I wanted to make this engagement as easy as possible with the virtual learning environment and um, take the stress out of it, um, make the learning environment easy to navigate and most of those things. Now, um, we're all familiar with the traditional um, layout of Moodle or Blackboard might be looking the same, where we have topics and 
uh, different elements there. And I wanted to totally transform this to really improve on what was available to us or to the students. And here um, we have now access to a grid format in Moodle that we can apply. But um, I said I wanted to go farther. There were a few things that were really important to me when redesigning this virtual learning environment. One thing was very clear signposting, very clear visuals. Um, but in addition to this, I very quickly came up to the things that Moodle was able to do out of the box, okay? And at that stage then, I had to say kind of what else can I do, how can I transform it? And I started to apply uh, some HTML code, uh, changing the HTML code using cards, like you can see on the top there. In the welcome section, I used HTML cards to condense information to make it very compact and easy to see. I had my <coughs> own information and contact details. I had an introductory video that helped students to navigate that virtual learning environment, as in Moodle, it explained what in each of the tiles underneath were. And I also used a module handbook, then that clearly informed students that had embedded links um, in PDF format. Uh, the UDL specifics then, um, I concentrated on multiple means of engagement and also representation. I just have a few examples then how I did this. Um, for example, the module handbook was also represented in the introduction section in a H5P accordion type of um, feature where the students could get the same information. So they had the option of either downloading the handbook and using the handbook or using the introduction section and the accordion feature there. Um, the next thing within the individual learning um, sections, um, I had PowerPoints available of the lectures. I had PDF handouts available of the lectures. And in addition to this, I also had uh, class recordings available. So the students had a great choice on how to engage with this learning session material. The next item then is um, the actual rec uh, recommended or required reading where I provided the students with um, the essential chapters in PDF format, but also I had the links to the books that were um, permalinks to the library where the students then could find out where the book was in the library. They could go down to the library, get the physical book out, or just read the chapters. Um, one thing then was important as well, because I use a lot of uh, videos on Moodle that I embed into Moodle, um, is to have the closed captions enabled all the time so that students have access to the transcript or the narration of the video so they can read up on it as well. Um, that's good. Feedback from the students overall was really encouraging. Uh, students commented very positively on the navigation of the Moodle page, on the accessibility of elements. They also um, commented on the highlighting of the current section that it was really easy to um, find a way around and that's just some comments there that the students gave me feedback wise on um, the redesign and one thing that was said today a number of times is I find that UDL will, be, will provide better education to everyone and for me personally I only have scratched the surface in relation to UDL with that redesign as I say I only completed the batch in 2021 there in spring but um, it's a great way forward to provide better education for everyone. Thanks very much. Great presentation. Um, does, <laughs> does anybody have any questions from the floor? Okay, I'm going to hit you up. Yes, go for it. You can count on me for questions. Vielen Dank. Uh, Ulrich. Um, I'm curious about the, I, I really like the design of the, uh, of the layout. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the areas that, that learners um, appreciate, and I suppose thinking about diversity of learners, so for example, if we have a student who may have a visual impairment, 
they find that consistency is one of the key elements uh, in relation to accessibility. So I'm just wondering what impact perhaps your uh, vanguard work, your leading work has had in relation to designing an accessible, um, simplified, navigable um, system may have had on your colleagues. Because to some extent, it's, it, 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 if it's just individual, mm. um, then it's, it, it's great, but it has to some extent limited impact across the whole university. So I'm just wondering if there may be scope for either conversations with other module leads or with other yeah. course leads in regards to, well, this is actually how it works. This mm. is how No, the thing is, um, not everybody is really comfortable to do in those HTML adjustments, but I used, for example, I used Bootstrap. That's not something that I developed myself. Like I didn't code or anything. I just applied HTML code and changed it to make it do what I do that I wanted it to do. But um, like colleagues of mine um, that work together with me on the same module have adopted now th these kind of things. But I definitely know the presentation time is very short to kind of explain it and to give a real overview of what has been done. But I definitely would love to share it w much wider and farther to kind of help people to incorporate this kind of changed layout of material. Thanks, thanks for the question. I have one question, if you don't mind. Is it time consuming? You said you put in HTML code into Moodle. So for some of us it's, who doesn't know what HTML is, can you tell a little bit? And did you have to have coding experience? Or how did you go about changing the, the code and putting it into Moodle? Could, could any of us do it without any HTML um, experience? Like I only got um, help from the learning technologists now in GMIT or in ATU Galway City, as we are now. Um, but it's quite simple. Once you have the code, you adjust the code. And adjusting the code, it's it's easy to learn. Writing the code, I, I wouldn't go near it. Like you know, but adjusting the code. And the thing is, for example, my learning section now or the learning section material section, well, learning session material section had only tiles, there's no scrolling. I tried to remove scrolling from Moodle as much as possible. Sometimes it's not possible, but everything is linked and everything is very easy accessible. Now I'm teaching culinary arts, so my students are very visual learners, so it really suits them. Where another department or another area of study might, it mightn't be as suitable. Yeah. Okay, okay, good, thanks. thanks. So our second speaker up, um, Jennifer Flynn, who is a librarian in ATU Sligo. And Jennifer is an academic librarian who has worked across a range of library services from specialized research um, to public library services. And in her presentation, she's going to look at attuning library services to student needs with UDL, refocusing social media platforms as a channel for teaching. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is the first time I've ever spoken at a conference, so it's lovely to have a conference that's been so welcoming um, to any of um, my peers and any of the delegates here uh, today. So when most people talk, think about um, teaching in a library, the attitude is either we don't do it or else we only do it in a very formal setting. Well, I'm here to tell you today that that's wrong and it's just completely wrong. And I'm also not going to talk about any formal channel for teaching. Um, my colleague, Dr. Ellen, um, spoke today earlier about uh, the UDL badge um, being developed for libraries for information literacy. Um, that is a formal channel that's been uh, developed primarily by uh, Sinead Kelly, the deputy librarian here, um, with a lot of other feedback. And I knew that was in development when I was going into the UDL project, so I picked a different area to focus on. And the area I'm focusing on is the 100,000 small teaching moments that we have as library staff. And I'm talking about being open from 9 a.m. in the morning till 9 p.m. at night, four days a week, being open on Fridays all day, being open on Saturdays. Some of the other libraries that are now part of ATU would run sessions longer on Saturdays and Sundays um, in the run-up to the exam period. These are the moments that happen outside of the classroom. These are the moments that happen outside of formal teaching structures. These are the moments that count. And these are the moments that COVID took away. 
So when I talk about redesign and I talk about COVID, I am talking about a student coming up and crying at the desk because they can't print something out, because they can't access something. I'm talking about a student who has dyslexia or has English isn't their first language and they're trying to navigate the library. These are all the moments that we're teaching them. We're teaching them how to use the library system. We're teaching them how to go over and access a program that they don't know how to use. These are the moments that aren't on any paper. So when I came to the redesign, I went big. I thought what we need to try and make up for the lack of interaction because the library was closed down physically for six months and then we had really limited access for about 18 months. We're really only going to be opening back up again full time, hopefully come September. And my idea was what do we need to plug that gap between the formal learning that's being developed and between those little moments of teaching that we had and we don't have any more. And I, the closest thing I could come up with was, because we do have an online chat session that we're still running, we have an online help desk, we do online tutorials, we all switch to that, was asynchronous on-demand learning. So basically, I'm talking about reusable digital assets deployed across all of the library's platforms. And when I say all of the platforms, we build and run our own website. We have our social media platforms. Um, again, the, uh, the information literacy channel that's being developed. You know, we're talking about moving towards an integrated library service across the whole ATU, and that is going to be a huge job. Um, so that was my idea. And when I'm talking about a reusable digital asset, I'm not talking just about videos, so they are very important, and the students really, really like them. Um, I'm talking about something that can be broken down from a graphic into a micro video, and then into a longer video that can be redeployed across all of our platforms. And then reality hit, um, because I was doing this for a UDL project within a very short time frame. So I work part time, um, so, and I also wear several different hats, all of the library staff do. Um, at the time I was doing this, I was undertaking other training, I was also working as a cataloguer, I was managing all of the social media content, then there is time on the desk that I give and online tutorials, and that doesn't include all of the team meetings going on within ourselves and then across with St Angela's and with our ATU colleagues. So the library has a big workload and we have a very small staff now. Hopefully, as we integrate in, we're going to have much bigger staff and we're going to want to pool all of our resources um, to provide all of you and all of our students um, with a much more uh, focused um, and much wider range of library services. But that's another, that's another story. So the constraints, as I said, and everyone faces them here, is time. How do you get this in? It's your resources. What do you have access to? And GDPR is also an issue when you're dealing with students. So really, the only resources I had access to were ones that were within the Microsoft, Microsoft 365's office suite because it was provided by the college. And also anything that had been pre-approved, the library has, because we have several platforms that we have um, pre-approved, like we are WordPress website um, and that's underpinned by a, another app that's specifically for libraries. And then the last constraint I faced was we actually had a staffing redeployment in the middle of me doing the UDL project. So I became responsible for the library blog, which meant a crash, crash course in WordPress, which I do not recommend, but I haven't made the website crash yet, so we're fine. Um, and I also became responsible for relaunching and redesigning the blog as well. So it wasn't just two social media platforms anymore, it was much larger. However, this last uh, item gave me an opportunity. As I said, all of the social media platforms that we had were now my responsibility and I was redesigning them. So the UDL principles that we redesigned, we now have um, three social media channels. Um, at the moment, they are uh, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram, um, which we moved to very recently. Um, we are looking at TikTok. But again, that is an ambition. Um, we have a bi-monthly blog post. Um, one of them is just a news feature update and the other is a feature length article, usually a how-to post on how to access a specific library resource um, or how to use a certain thing. We've, I've written ones on how to use an introduction to EndNote, which is the referencing software that we provide free of charge to all of our students. Um, I went through how to use OLIS, which is our internal search engine for searching the library website, both the simple and advanced search. And also we have a podcast, so now I make an audio file of those longer features and they go up once a month um, and I use Microsoft Stream to do that. Um, and I should also say all of those 
where the UDL comes in is not only um, the podcast, it's the blog posts and all of the posts are screen reader friendly. There is no text within the graphics um, of our posts. It's just a graphic image. It is, has been all text tagged. Um, all of the text is within the text boxes where it should be because this is where it's screen reader friendly. Um, we use camel case for our hashtags because this is easier uh, for people to read as well. Um, the blog post um, adheres to, I build it in Microsoft Word and I build it with the accessibility headings in it and then I transfer it into WordPress. So that is all screen render friendly. And again, any graphics or videos that would be used in there um, would also be uh, have their alt uh, text tags. And then finally, the podcast, as I said, is built in, is transferred into um, Microsoft Stream because that automatically generates closed captions and unfortunately I don't have time to transpose those. So um, if anybody's looking at things, really Microsoft is fantastic. Um, feedback now, and I know time is flying by. Um, I was in a very unusual position. Most of you have live on-site classes that you can interact with. I'm a librarian. I interact with all of the students. At last count, when we've done this just recently, there are 17,000 full-time equivalent students in the ATU, 17,000. Now that isn't actually a student number because that means that when we were paying for things like databases and doing projections, like that doesn't reflect say the number of students. So half of those students could actually be postgraduates or studying part-time. So we could actually have half that 17,000, 8,000. We could actually have 25,000 students and we think it might actually be closer in numbers. So those are the students that I'm dealing with. You get the privilege of working very closely with your students. You may have them for one class intensely, uh, one module for a semester, or going, you could see them for years. We don't. So we have to build our bonds with them another way. The feedback um, I used was I have built and run the Yates Library Annual Survey for staff and students for the last three years. Um, and I used the feedback from the first two years of that survey as my feedback and the feedback this year has reinforced it that the thing that staff and students want is they want videos, they want podcasts, they want every, things that are alternative to text um, forms of information that the library provides. The other bit is the anecdotal evidence that's clear evidence here today listening to everyone talk. It's also coming from my colleagues at the library desk. It's coming from the online tutorials we provide, the chats with staff and students, and queries that have come in through our online help desk and our live chat feature. So on reflection, what would I do differently? Well, I would like to say I'd start off with a smaller idea, but after listening to the talks today, no, the big idea was the best one. Even if I couldn't implement it yet, knowing that that is what I am building towards is what keeps me going. Um, I would have looked at maybe the resources available to me before I started the UDL project and actually gone, well, where can I push myself in learning a new skill or developing um, a focus on a particular area, rather than, as I said, having a crash course in WordPress midway through, um, and also you know, learning how to do uh, streaming, um, <laughs> which is a, a totally different skill for me. Um, but would I do anything else differently? No, not really. That's, that's it. It's, you know, you need to push yourself with the UDL, but because of the workload and the constraints we're under, I do understand it might just be one area that need, you need to push yourself on. So the next steps, and I can see the red counter going there up in the corner. Well, my, my ambitions are, well, first of all, diversify the platforms that we have. Um, as I said, we're looking, we moved on to Instagram recently, we'd be looking at moving on to TikTok. I do have to move on to one platform at a time and I also have to get approval for moving on to these platforms. The second thing would be to create more diverse content. Um, anyone who's looked at the library website will see that it is very text heavy. That tends to be the case in most library websites. We have a lot of information. A lot of it is actually quite technical. It needs to be quite detailed. But um, we are planning kind of on upgrading um, our website and creating uh, more opportunities uh, for students to engage with material in different ways. That is a big project, it is bigger than me. Um, so like that brings me on to my third ambition, which is in the new ATU library service, um, which is multiple campuses, multiple libraries, I would like to be the UDL advocate for that service. Um, we don't have someone in charge of social media at the moment. It is something that we have pinned as a service. We recently just had our first team meeting of, you know, a huge number of library staff uh, for us when we're used to dealing with a team of 10. 
uh, we had uh, 30 plus people at the meeting, um, and that's not even including St. Angela's team, which hopefully will be joining us soon, fingers crossed. Um, I want to be the UDL advocate. I want my colleagues to understand why this is so important when we build things, that we build them from the ground up um, with UDL uh, based in them. And uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to see. Amazing work, Jennifer. I don't know how you get through it um, and you've done it um, and, and kudos to you. I think sometimes when we try to embed UDL, we start off big in some cases, some small, but there's a knock on effect and you end up taking on more work that you didn't envisage. But in the outcome, you've learned more from UDL because of that. So, so well done. Um, has anybody got any questions from the floor? Yes, Trish. Thank you very much. Uh, it's just a comment, Jennifer. I think you are a blessing to ATU Sligo and they are so lucky to have you. Thank you very much. Hi. I'm just wondering, did you use any accessibility auditing tools when you were looking at the websites? Um, the website because we use WordPress um, there is uh, accessibility tools built into it now that's the system librarians are managing that um, and now we have three system librarians so we're all actually very excited about that at the moment um, we also use we use a specific project uh, product for the pages that underlie so the WordPress is just the home page of the website and certain sections of it everything that's text otherwise is created by library staff within a product called um, LibGuides, and you'll see it on the library website, and that whole product, it's designed specifically for library services. It's basically it's an industry leader for uh, any kind of academic or public libraries, and that is built to be um, provide accessible headings. Um, the whole layout of that is supposed to be accessible, um, and like that's one of the reasons that we picked that product, um, is, is that it, it's accessible for screen readers to read. Um, though I, I do accept that, you know, there is a lot of text on the library website. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Yeah. Anybody else have any questions? Okay, I'm going to throw one at you. Okay. Why did you choose to, to choose? Why did you choose social media as your teaching method? Um, I chose social media as my teaching method because I only took it over two years ago at the start of the pandemic. I had never used social media before. It's not something that I use personally. Um, and we needed it. Um, we had, just before the pandemic happened, we had had another staff redeployment and rearrangement. So the stat library member who um, used to deal with it um, was gone. She moved to another department. Um, so I volunteered to take it on because it was a big worry. It was coming up with staff meetings. We really wanted to be able to reach out and, to, and talk to the students. And that was how I did the first online survey as well. Um, and I said, well, look, I, I'll take it over if you, if you give me the permissions and give me a few guidelines. Um, so I, I just took it over and went from there. Um, now, I moved it from, it was an ad hoc posting. So we now have three posts a week. One of them is um, a campaign post. One of them, so that's um, uh, moved to a Wednesday now. So the campaign post ties now into the blog post because the blog is now at uh, the core of our social media. So the feature length blog post. So our campaign that ties into that will be uh, recently the one we did was exam tips. So I wrote on the exam tips. Um, that was the feature article. And then uh, just for the two weeks of the exams, there were two micro videos um, of exam tips that were listed in the article, broke them down into two or three pieces and put them up as micro videos um, on our social media post. Now, just an image on, on Facebook and it was micro video on Instagram. Um, and then just uh, the article was uh, on Twitter. Um, uh, the link to the article was on Twitter. So, I mean, really, I missed talking to the students. Um, that was the thing all the library staff say and when we come in and we see all the plexiglass and we, we have to keep our distance and that's that's what we miss like that's why a lot of people are in library services it's to help the students and um, to provide information with them to work with them and um, so like I got involved because there was a need for it um, and I said look I'm, I'm going to try and do it 
Um, and I think since then, we went from an ad hoc service to, as I said, it's three posts a week, it's two blog posts a month, it's one podcast a month. And that is continuing. That is something I have built into my workload that I, I can perpetuate um, as a service. And it would be something I'd look to build on now for the ATU library services. Okay. Thanks very much, Ulrich and Jennifer. Um, so I'd like to call on the final theme, theme four, and call Dr. Geraldine Dowling to chair. Welcome everybody. So we've made it to our last theme of the evening and today's theme is on assessment and um, adoption of alternative assessment practices through a UDL lens. Um, as the last presenter said, my name is Geraldine. I'm your chair for this session. I'd like to introduce you to our first speaker, which is Dr. Liam Morris. He's from ATU Galway City. So welcome, Liam. And he's going to talk about assessing the impact of providing a choice in presenting a review paper under the UDL framework. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Geraldine, for, for that introduction. My name is Liam Morris. I'm from ATU Galway. And the title of my today's talk, Assessing the Impact of Providing a Choice uh, in Presenting a Review Paper under the UDL Framework. So what did I do? I completed the 10-week UDL course um, that was hosted by a head and I got the UDL badge in the first semester of this academic year and my talk today will be on the redesign activity that I completed. So just more briefly, I think everyone in the room knows what the motivation for UDL is, inspired by the cognitive neuroscience research to, in a, to, to help the understanding of what happens during learning. And it's to remove the one fit all approach to teaching and learning. So my redesign activity looked at multiple means of action and expression. So looking at one of the neural networks, the frontal lobe. So for, for uh, this UDL, um, look, I was providing a choice of assignment hand up. So how did I do this? So I have uh, fourth year uh, biomedical and mechanical engineering uh, students who take um, medical advice for soft tissues in their first semester. And then I um, continued on the choice of assessment into the second semester for medical advice for heart mm, uh, tissues. Now, I never considered providing a choice for assessment before. If they were to present, they'd have to present. If they had to write a paper, they'd have to write a paper. And that was it. They had to do it a certain way. And I think I'm probably not the only lecturer who does that, especially in, I suppose, in engineering would be kind of rich it that way. Uh, whether that's good or bad is another in a debate as well. Um, so, but for presentations, it's common practice. You know, in uh, conferences, for example, we have a choice of either doing a podium or a poster. Now, maybe we might put in for a podium, but we end up getting a poster. But maybe someone else has made that in a choice there. So that can happen as well. Uh, during the pandemic, we all had a choice of doing video presentations. So I would have had to do a few that way where you record yourself. And say, that's a lot less stressful than just doing it live. Uh, and you can either do it through Teams or Zoom, as we would have uh, done this in the past. You know? And during the, uh, for the redesign activity, we were given a choice as well of doing a written report or a video. So I did the written report, I probably found that a little easier, but, um, but um, during the pandemic we're doing a lot of screen casts as well for my students using Camtasia, for example. Um, so providing a, a presentation choice then. So for the first semester, I, uh, for mechanical devices, soft tissues, I got students to do a review paper. So it was on a medical device or a therapy. So I would have given the students a choice of what type of device they want to look at, whether it's robotic surgery, uh, stents, or for, for heart attacks, or nebulizers, or mm, grafting, for example. 
In the second semester, then, um, they were to do a review paper on the up-and-coming medical startups or medical innovation. So from Enterprise Ireland's big ideas, uh, they show um, from last year's the up-and-coming Irish Indigenous startups. Also, I said you can also look up the videos on, that are provided by Cleveland Clinic on some of the medical innovations. And then as a, another option, the students could select from from one of the startups from the iHubs. And so this provided the students with a choice on what topic they wanted to select. Um, so this is where, and I'll talk a little bit at the end, I did get them to write a report. So they had to do a review paper, give them guidelines on it, but they were able to put in what information they wanted within the main body of the text. So. Um, these are examples of review papers from six uh, uh, students. But the, the choice was on presenting the review paper to their peers. So I said, right, I'll do an initial uh, anonymous poll on Mentimeter to see, well, would there be an appetite here? Would providing a choice be more problematic or not? So I asked them, would you like to have a choice in presentation style? And 97% um, of them said yes. Okay. Um, the other person that did say no was kind of maybe, so you could nearly say 100% there. And in what format would you like to consider? So I gave them options of a, a brochure, a poster, a video, an in-class presentation or something else that I didn't think of, so if they wanted to come to me. So did an, an initial poll there, and you can see there is a spread there. So the students would be engaged in doing a different type of presentation. Uh, uh, format. So the, I provided them with guidelines. So all presentations, whether it was video or not, or poster or in-class presentation, had to be presented to their peers. There was a time allocation of four to five minutes. And then because I decided that it would have different types of presentations, I designed rubrics there for each one, from in-class presentation, the video style, to poster and brochures as well. And that gave uh, guidelines on what the students um, were expected and also um, a marking scheme there as well. So what formats were presented on the day then? So from 34 students, um, they just kept a video, in-class presentation and poster. The majority choose the video option uh, in the first semester for the first report, 59%. That increased 76 for semester two. And their file formats were more or less recorded PowerPoint uh, presentations or MP4. Uh, In-class presentations in 35% in semester one, and that uh, reduced to 21% in the second semester. And the poster then was 6% semester one, and that dropped to 3% the second semester. So students' feedback then, which um, I designed a questionnaire, I got ethical approval. Uh, there was 15 questions. There was uh, there was consent in there from the students, there was open and closed in uh, questions and there was a Likert scale. I got 17 respondents to this. So one, uh, so two questions here. Did you like having a choice on how to present your review paper topic and would you prefer this choice for another assessment type? 94% said yes. Uh, open in the questions, in what comments do you have regarding a choice on the review paper? So just plucking out some of the um, headings in there, they liked having the option, they found it very enjoyable, they were interested in having that option as well, they liked being able to select, they found it easier and they found it not limited. And some of the quotes then from the students was, having a choice helps the author feel more free to create the review in their own way. I think it's much easier to talk about something you choose to write about. A very good idea to get a research topic you find interesting. And in what comments do you have regarding having a choice on the assessment uh, type? They found it less stressful. Uh, they found it they, they could be creative. It suits their needs better. They're more comfortable playing to their strengths. And I'll just read out just a few of these. I think it takes a lot of pressure off knowing that you, have, uh, you can choose how to present your work. Very good idea. Let students play to their strengths uh, with less stress. It's good to give students the option they can showcase their best work. Um, and then I asked them, what did you 
like most about having an uh, assessment type. So I just pulled out what was coming from all the respondents there and the most common theme was less stressful. And that was an interesting one because I went back, even though it's an anonymous poll, I can see what each student, what the first student and how they filled out the poll. Some of the students that said it was less stressful actually did an in-class presentation. So having a choice, they still found it less stressful. Um, so that was an interesting uh, finding there. Uh, at the Likert scale, then I've a, a series of questions here. I'll just focus on some of the more some of the more popular ones there. So, providing a choice for assessment type should be considered for other modules. And uh, second place, then providing a choice of assessment should be considered a permanent feature of this module. Um, assessment method choice can showcase your best work and play to your strengths. And then one other one that came in at 100% for uh, agree and strongly agree. Um, assessment method choice reduces the stress levels associated with assignment hand-ups. And then in conclusion, then I've kind of a two part here and I'll probably revisit this next semester with other modules. At this stage, I, at, that st at this stage, I was kind of reluctant to provide learners with alternative options for writing a review paper. I'm supposed to, simply because engineers don't like to write, even though you can't, it's a necessary skill. So um, it is necessary for engineers because if you're trying to uh, get an employment in industry, especially in the med tech sector, you have to be able to write reports. If you want to get a postgraduate degree, you have to write a thesis. If you're doing a PhD, you have to write journal papers. So um, these are important skill sets. My main ob observation from the redesign activity was very positive feedback from the students. They found it very enjoyable. It wasn't limited in any way. Uh, it suited their needs so they could feel they were more creative. Students also learned from each other, so they saw how to save files. So there was errors in the, say, in the first semester where they thought their PowerPoint presentation was fully automatic, but it, it wasn't. You had to hit the automatic on every single slide. So they, that didn't happen for the second semester. So they learned from each other how to save files, have better quality files as well. And it reduced stress levels associated with assignment hand-ups. Thank you very much. Okay. Any questions? Liam, thank you very much. Can I put some questions out to the floor? Uh, I'll, I'll try and keep it simple. So in regards to their engagement on the course, how did you find, were they more engaged on the course? Um, you mentioned the like less stress and enjoyment. So in my research that I've been looking into is um, that intrinsic motivation and having a choice of uh, assignments would um, possibly make them more engaged. Uh, did you find that in, in your course? Yes, yeah, so I would set the time in the lab as well. So, and I'd walk around the class encouraging them. So having the, giving them a range of topics to research first themselves. So which topics, for example, if they're looking at a new startup, uh, instead of, Instead of being provided, you must do startup A, you do startup B, you do product A, product B. They were able to go and select which one suited, which one they found most interesting, and that seemed to stimulate their interest in. Mm -hmm. And that and that first choice then led to the second one, then where they could present it whichever way they felt more comfortable. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Liam. I'm just wondering what motivated you to, to focus on this in the first instance. And whilst I ask that question, it's a loaded question. Thank you. Uh, because I'm really mindful of the, the death, I'm not sure if you're aware, but the de death of uh, Natasha uh, Abrahart at uh, University of Western England in Bristol. Um, so the university was found to be in... Um, non-compliance with the equality legislation in, in the UK. And it was a landmark uh, legislation, or a landmark finding. And that only occurred like about two, um, two weeks ago, I think, two to three weeks ago. 
uh, where uh, bec because a student had, had severe stress about the prospect of presenting. And it's funny what we do as academics to ourselves as well. You know, everybody who has presented has got, oh, God, thank God that's over. Yes, you know? yes, yes. So it's really interesting, I think, um, and maybe we'll look at UDLizing how we go about our own business as well, you yeah. know, in relation to the expectations that we that we create. And I'm not, I'm not saying that, that uh, this is no reflection on, on the absolutely fabulous nature of what we've had here today, but very long-winded um, uh, way of asking you, what motivated you just to focus upon that? I suppose I had two motivations. One was that um, you do have the option of the different styles of presenting, whether it's a poster, a video, or an ink, or an actual uh, podium presentation. Unfortunately, you can't ask them to do all these aspects. So you're giving the students the choice to do that. And other students would then see um, what that's like and learn from the, the different formats there. Uh, the second one was I would have seen students in the past, really good students, would panic and they wouldn't show up that day and they would be frightened to go, even fourth year students, and they would deliberately lose the five or ten percent and they nearly get 80, 90 percent in a written exam or, or, the, or the CAs like where they don't feel as stressed. So this could be a halfway house where they can do a video. Okay, it is going to be presented, but that might take some of the fear and then it, it might encourage them then in the second semester that they might go an, another step where they start to, you know, gain confidence from that. They'll see their other students are doing it as well and they might just learn from that as well because we do have to try and train our students for interviews and, um, you know, um, doing a presentation in front of your peers and for and, and for final year projects as well. Um, you know, for like for our final year projects, we make it compulsory that they have to present in front of in front of the the supervisors, and that can be very challenging as well. But they will be going out into interviews, looking for a, a job in this sector. So you know, you're trying to prepare them for that as well. It's getting a balance right there. You know, students are fearful. Um, so you do kind of want to mimic some of that um, and help them as well. Okay. Everything so. Liam, thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. I know there were some more questions, so maybe afterwards you might get a chance to, to talk one on one. Um, okay, in the interest of time, I'm going to move to our next presenter. Our next presenter is, um, I would say last but not least, um, Miss Anne Tynan, and she's from ATU Galway. Um, so welcome, Anne. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, we'll, we'll get through this uh, fairly quickly, hopefully, uh, because to be honest, a lot of what I want to talk about has probably been said many, many times already, um, but much like uh, Liam and what Liam uh, has just been talking about, um, I took the digital badge, the, the National Forum digital badge, uh, at the same time, I think, last year, um, towards the end of 2021. Um, and coming from, I suppose, professional kind of accounting background, I, I'm in the School of Business, so I teach accounting and finance and tax. Uh, which students are obviously, you know, particularly tax and, and tax is my own background and students come to it uh, sometimes for the first time and trying to engage them with it. It's quite technical, content technical modules ha has always been a little bit of a struggle and, and particularly on the assessment side of it, I've always found, I always thought we were the only ones restricted by assessment in terms of professional body exemptions and stuff doing the UDL badge, of course, I realise that's not the case. We're not the only ones, but a lot of my classes have final end of term closed book exam, exam hall based exams, um, which they find tough. Um, and then trying to bring something into the continuous assessment element that will engage them a little bit more, that will give them a little bit more scope to think about what they're doing was always something that I kind of thought about, but also struggled with. So. Um, when I took on the UDL badge, I kind of saw this, I suppose, as the opportunity to kind of do
do something with assessment, with continuous assessment, bringing in the UDL principles. So that's where, where I suppose my presentation is coming from today. Um, so um, Jennifer was talking about the big idea approach. I took the opposite <laughs> as I was going into the UDL badge. And again, the advice from, from Cormac, who was our um, facilitator and uh, one of the facilitators in GMIT as it was then, uh, that was the advice to you know take something small and work with that. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what I did. And my results are very much, I suppose I didn't do a survey with the students, but talked to them about what I did, what they found and kind of got their feedback in the classroom and kind of subsequently after that as well. So I'll talk a little bit about what, what I did find by doing this redesign. Um, so, you know, like all of us, I suppose, looking at the UDL principles and looking at the classroom that we now have. And I've been teaching kind of for over 15 years from kind of professional level, uh, postgrad level, undergrad level. And, and the classroom's only becoming more diverse. So I suppose it's trying to trying to engage, you know, from your undergraduate student coming from secondary school, leaving cert, from, to the mature student who's coming in uh, at a later stage in life, has a bit more experience, and also then all of the other diversities that we have in, in the classroom. So trying to both engage and challenge them all and all, give them all something to think about when, when they're in the classroom as well. So looking at the principles, I suppose I was probably primarily focused on, on the multiple means of engagement when I was looking at, at my redesign activity. And I also say I, was, I also, for some unknown reason, ended up doing the academic writing practice digital badge as well with the National Forum at the same time. Um, I, I don't know why, because I'm also doing PhD, so it was just probably procrastination on that side of it, to be quite honest. But I thought, thought I was doing the academic writing practice to help the PhD, doing the UDL badge to help my teaching. But actually, they were all quite complementary of each other in the end. Uh, and I suppose in terms of what I did, I found actually it probably hit probably two or three of the, the principles at the same time as well. And that's purely on reflection when I've looked at it afterwards, really. So this was my uh, assignment structure, my assessment structure that I had set out at the start of the year for the students. So it's broken down. As I said, my final end of term exam was set at 80%. There wasn't really anything I could do with that. Um, so it was trying to break down the other 20%, which isn't a lot, but trying to work with, with that to give some choice to students. Um, so by the time I was into the UDL badge, actually I was left with this third assignment uh, to work with, uh, which was quite a low stakes assignment, which kind of worked for me, I suppose, in the UDL badge and the redesign activity. Uh, I did have to choose the topic and I, I suppose, choose the topic of a very exciting topic of looking at revenue audits and trying to get students to understand. Now, the benefit for me was that this was very much a theoretical part of the module was always going to be kind of a low stakes element of the module. They're never going to be, have a very uh, heavy question on this, uh, either in assessment or in an exam. But uh, it, it, by putting this on the assignment, one, I could work a little bit more with it in terms of the options that I, ha I had for or would have for assessing it. But also it, kind of, it allowed me to not have to spend an hour in the classroom talking through revenue audits, which is as you can imagine, not very exciting in the classroom context. These are third year finance and economic students, I should have said at the start. Um, so it allowed me to actually give them a bit of self-directed learning, a bit of research activity, and let them go off and kind of read a little bit about it. So that was what I choose. And I took what I had learned on kind of the academic writing practice uh, badge uh, as the ladybird kind of assessment approach or, or design approach to this. And we all know the lovely Ladybird books, but it's probably a bit like the Monopoly example earlier on that probably not everybody had actually heard of the Ladybird. I didn't really go into the fact that it was called the Ladybird assignment with students. But the idea was that we would take this topic and put it in a context that would make it very easy to understand. And that's the whole concept of the Ladybird books. So I did explain to this, this to them in the class. And I suppose my approach to it changed in terms of the UDL perspective. My approach to the assignment changed in terms of normally I'd give them a written one page document with the assignment task, 
what they were going to be looking, uh, what they were going to be writing about, how many words they had to write, submission deadline, and off you go. This time I took the approach of, yes, I put that up on Moodle, but I also took kind of 10 minutes out of class time, tutorial class time, over two different weeks before the submission date to one, explain the assignment to them. I did explain the concept of that I wanted this in a format that was going to be easily explained to fifth, sixth class primary school children. So pretend they were going into a classroom, pretend they were giving this to young children and therefore it had to be easy to explain. I also gave them the added benefit of saying, look, we're doing this for a 5% assignment, but I'm conscious that this might take a little bit more time, so there also will be a question on the final exam paper on this. So it kind of gave them a little bit more than just the 5% to go on. Um, I took the 10 minutes and I kind of put it out to them and said, look, do a bit of research on this now in the classroom. And they all looked at me and kind of went, what do you mean? So I said, pull out your phone and look up and search what you get for revenue audits. And actually giving them that little bit of time, I was able to kind of see, well, okay, what sources are you looking at for information? Where are you getting it from? Is it good quality? Is it relevant? Is it an Irish context or not? And actually giving that time to us, we were able to give, I was able to give feedback to them. They were able to learn from their peers. Uh, and that's something I probably wouldn't have done very much in the past. So that was useful. And we did that over two weeks, which you'll see on the next slide, um, which was useful for kind of dealing with their questions at a later stage. I then gave them the option of how they present. So gave them the option of the essay, poster, they could do presentation slides, they could do videos or podcasts. And I did put quite strict kind of, I suppose, uh, lengths and kind of the number of slides, etc. that they, they had. And they had all this, I suppose, on a the assignment task and they also had the grading rubric for this as well. So that was all shared in the classroom and on Moodle. Uh, we did it over kind of the, the couple of weeks, as I said, with the, the final submission then in week 11. And I'm just conscious of time. So just really quickly, I suppose, to, uh, I suppose, again, a bit like one of the earlier presenters, actually the feedback for me was, or one of the most positive kind of points of feedback that I took was that there were, um, the submissions all came in way ahead of the deadline. So they all submitted, kind of, the, the deadline was Friday, they all most had submitted by the Tuesday or Wednesday. Uh, for, and for me that was like, okay, well, they had started working it in the class, they didn't procrastinate on this, unlike me and uh, other aspects, but they, they got it in, they got it done. Uh, and they weren't overwhelmed by the fact that they were kind of covering something they weren't, weren't necessarily spending a huge amount of time on in class. The other, and I want to get my numbers here, kind of out of the submissions that came in, some still did, did do the essay, but only about three of them did, did the essay. One did a podcast, which was nice. There was 11 PowerPoint presentations, which was probably higher than I probably expected, and there were 16 posters. Uh, submitted. So there was a nice variety. For me, the benefit was that actually the posters were really easy to correct, really quick to correct, as were the, the presentations. And it, it was kind of a nice variety. The marks were, were obviously quite high for it, but you know, they did put in the work and that was obvious in the submissions that they made. So um, for them, you know, they found the quizzes and they found the, the exams, which are calculation based, quite kind of technical content in there. They found them challenging. So this was kind of a way of them being able to kind of improve their marks a little bit. These are just some of the examples which kind of I thought were quite creative and quite nice. And, and this is not content that they could have necessarily found anywhere else. There's, you know, there's not really any examples. The mind map I thought was particularly good. And again, like the feedback from these students and kind of something that was nice about the feedback was the language that they used in their feedback was all kind of uh, reflective of kind of the UDL principles without kind of, they weren't necessarily told there was UDL involved in this, but they, one of the students said, you know, we could construct it in a way that made most, made the most sense to us. The poster was easier to learn from. Um, it was great that you had to give us a choice in that sense that the student said that, you know, some people aren't very tech savvy, so actually they could go back to the essay if they wanted to or do the, the slides. They didn't have to rely on the poster. Um, it was a great way for people to get engaged and learn. And that's from the students. And I thought, you know, that's just kind of very 
positive, nice feedback to get from them that they're seeing themselves the, the benefit of this. So, you know, uh, obviously one student, uh, one of uh, kind of the students that had the, the slide, the presentation or the poster here, said would have, they would have liked greater uh, scale for it. They would have liked more, a higher percentage for it. And I think that probably was very fair in terms of the work that they had put into it, probably deserved uh, that they're waiting for it. So just really quickly, I suppose that is probably something that I would look at again of building a you know, higher percentage in for this task, but also developing the topic to be a little bit more complicated and a little bit more challenging for them so that they would have to do a little bit more research, a little bit more um, time into it on their own side. Um, you know, I think it, it was a nice opportunity for me, it was a nice opportunity for them, and I think something that promotes, promotes and motivates that deeper learning, those research skills, those critical skills for the students. Um, so yeah, overall, I think the, the UDL, is much like everybody else, is was you know really lovely to spend time reflecting on how we're teaching and what we're teaching them and how we can help the students engage more with us. So thank you. So thank you. Can we see if we have any questions? we had the experience of the poster assignment as well. I'm just wondering, have you put any thought into what you think would be an appropriate allocation of grades? Oh, I, I, think, I, would, I think I'd probably look Thank at you. the topic, like, you know, building it up into even the 20%, um, I think, but, but I would really have to develop the topic and, and how I'm pulling different parts of the module together into it. Um, to make it worthwhile for them. And again, purely on the basis that it's restricted by the final end of term exam having to be kind of 70-80%. Um, so, you know, I think the scope for it to be 50% in some modules, but again, that's module dependent, I would say, and topic dependent. Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually from an accounting background myself, so I know how heavy of a, a subject it can be. Um, a buzzword you hear a lot um, from the professional bodies um, would be adding value. Um, do you think UDL has the scope to be an adding value kind of service in accountancy training um, and the industry itself going forward? Yeah, and I, I think it's, it's something that has, I suppose, occurred to me uh, looking at it myself now over the last 12 months, that we probably need to be talking to the professional bodies about UDL. I'm not, and I might be very unfair by saying I don't think it's something that's on their radar very much. Um, IFRSs, for example, they're, they're a massive, massive document. Even just a practical explanation of yep. kind of the application um, of the IFRSs, I think would help a lot of students going yep. forward. Yep. Um, so it's something that it could be brought even forward to the professional bodies yeah. um, from the educators when it comes exactly. to discussion on yep. um, exemptions yep. um, and that kind of thing. So yeah, hopefully I, I, it goes that far. Yeah, I think there is, I think there is a, a need for somebody to push the professional bodies on it yeah. from you know, the text heavy documents and, and even tax legislation is 800 pages of text you know, in, in one, one piece of tax legislation. Mm -hmm. And some postgrad students are looking at that and expected to study from that. Yeah. Um, but even but taking your right, example there, if you were to talk, take a class and just even look at the practicality of what's involved in doing a revenue audit, that would open up the ground to discussion on what's needed, what areas do you assess, um, and the audit relevance of it. Yeah. So yeah, it's... Yeah, it's, and, it's and I think the added value is that if you have people that are aware of UDL and if students are going out knowing that they've kind of had UDL incorporated, Obviously, uh, you know, obvious to them that they've had UDL incorporated and you have more diversity in the type of student that's going into accountancy. You have people that are better able to interact on a, you know, in, on, in the day-to-day -day world. <laughs> so, yeah, there's, there's, I think there's a lot of work that could be done with professional bodies and the accountancy side of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, this is just a general question really around assessment choice. And I suppose it's just a, a question I have in my own mind is how do we balance, I suppose, the, the benefit and the learning that comes from challenge, you know, the experience of a, a challenging assessment that puts us out of our comfort zone versus making a choice about assessment type that keeps us within our comfort zone. Um, and I suppose it's a, a comment that was made earlier that, you know, we, we, you know, we might have all found ourselves in situations of having to do something that we found really difficult. And we go, oh, thank God that's over. But we also sometimes maybe say, God, I'm thrilled with myself. I did that because it was, I knew it was going to be hard and it was going to be a challenge, but I still did it and I, I succeeded. And there's nothing like the buzz from, you know, having been challenged and, and achieving it. So it's how do we balance that when we've choice of assessment? And I suppose my, my question is very much around how we present the choice and, and how we support students to make the choice. Um, and I suppose, is it always about keeping somebody within their comfort zone? And I suppose balancing that with putting some, you know, somebody making the choice to go outside their their comfort zone. I suppose it's the informed choice really and the learning and the benefit that comes from doing something challenging and that puts us out of our comfort. I suppose it's just something that I'm, I'm left with as was um, yeah. in the context of choice of assessment. And I, and I think the time in the classroom in terms of that choice and challenge and it is it's trying to get the balance of and it's like, it's like the over assessment part of it as well that you know it's three components to a CA too much for for students, and it probably is to a certain extent, but the time, you know, even just the 10 minutes in the classroom with them, the second week that we were looking at it, even that discussion helps, I think, the students make that informed choice, actually, as to what could they manage that wasn't going to be over, overly stressful, because that, you don't want that for them either, but, but just giving them that opportunity, I think, and to, to talk about it was probably helped them. And it, you're right, the informed choice, you probably was... I just wanted to add to the comment that you made there because it is just about choice. So even from a perspective of maybe in semester one, you take the choice that's the easier choice and you watch your, your, co your fellow students. And I'm just thinking, I'm speaking as I suppose as a lifelong learner and you see them take that other choice. And the next step is to take the challenge and you'll reach out that little bit further. So I think having just choice alone and then it's steps. Um, thank you very, very much. Okay, so I'd like to welcome Jennifer and Tam Zinn back up to the podium to show their uh, work. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, if you cast your mind back to this morning, you'll remember that we said we'd be inviting you to join us in our graphic facilitation. So at the back of your notepads, you have a sticky person. <laughs> <laughs> if you look in Jennifer's uh, <laughs> direction now, you'll see one. See, I'm not good at drawing. <laughs> You'll also notice that you received a black marker pen, yeah? <laughs> and we'd like you to customise your person, so draw whatever you like on them, add your name. And then we'd like you to come over to the graphic and place your person on the journey towards UDL. There's some way stations. So um, you can decide where to place your, your person. And we also have a quick conference evaluation. So what you thought about today, um, it is on the right hand side of the image and there's a chair right there in front. Um, and we've got four post-its in the back here also. So these are the call out post-its. So we want you to use one of each of these for the evaluation. Doesn't so we're, matter which colour. Yeah, it doesn't matter which one or which colour. And we're just asking you to either draw or write 
uh, what you um, would like to see more of in a conference like this, what you would see less, like to see less of, what we got just right, and any other comments that you have. So feel free to complete it with your marker here, because it comes out best with the marker, and place it on the wall. So, and have a bit of fun. You can doodle, it doesn't have to be text. So if there's anyone in the room that has done the graphic facilitation course with ourselves, um, <laughs> if you could maybe move around the room and help anyone that needs a bit of help or ideas, and feel free to get up and walk around and, and come over to our graphic and add to it. We'd love to find out all your... your